let's have a look at different fairness criteria now. We already talked about fairness as one of the dimensions of responsible AI, and it's finally time to define fairness more mathematically. So to actually implement fairness in machine learning model, we need a mathematical understanding or mathematical notation that can help us quantify how much unwanted bias we actually have in any given model or model predictions. So fairness criteria now, they will describe or give us a way to describe a connection between the sensitive attributes or groups that we have in our data and the true or predicted labels mathematically. And there exist many different fairness criteria and Barocas and Hart actually introduced a taxonomy and placed the different criteria in the categories of independence criteria, separation and sufficiency. And there's also variations and relaxations of the criteria, and that's just to make concessions to actually be able to implement them in machine learning and programming. One thing to note about the criteria is that they're actually mutually exclusive, so you can't optimize for all of them at the same time. Another thing that's important to note is that those criteria do not necessarily map to established legal or social understandings of equity, and you can follow this link to have more details about that topic. And a final word of warning before we actually look at some of these criteria in more detail, and that is don't just implement the criteria and hope for the best. Always make sure to also evaluate the performance of the model using some of the bias measures that we had a look at in the previous section. So how can we use these fairness criteria in practice now? We said they help us establish a connection between the different groups or sensitive attributes and the fairness notions. Well, they can help us understand how to prepare our data so they can guide the data transformation that we might need to undertake. They can help us tweak the way in which models learn by constraining the training process, or they can also guide us on how to make adjustments to model predictions and all of that with the goal to reduce unwanted bias. And another thing that's important here is that these fairness criteria, we can actually employ them at different stages of the model life cycle. So we can use some of this bias mitigation and these fairness criteria before the model is trained. So that would be pre-processing or pre-training. We can do it while the model is learning. So that would be in training or in processing. And we can also modify results after the model has already produced predictions. So that would be post-processing. To really understand these criteria in more detail, we need to have a quick detour and look at probability basics. So the probability PR of an event A is the sum of the probabilities of the outcomes that make up A. So very simplified here, you have the probability of an event A and you total the number of outcomes that make up the event, the thing that you're interested in, and you divide by the total number of possible outcomes. And once again, you have a link here for more details and basic probability introduction. But just keep this equation in mind because we're going to use probability in just a moment. We need to take it one step further now and talk about conditional probability. Where conditional probability, probability of B given A, so of an event B given A is the probability that the event B will occur given the knowledge that event A has already occurred. And how do we calculate conditional probability? Well, we can look at the probability of A and B occurring at the same time and then divide by the probability of A occurring. And once again, you have a link here for more details on how to actually derive that. But this is just the notation that we're going to use for conditional probability. And what are we going to condition on? Well, we're going to condition on group memberships, on having sensitive attributes belonging to a group, yes or no. And this leads us directly to the first criterion, the independence criteria. And this is also called statistical parity. So what we're trying to say here is something is fair if indeed there is no difference on whether or not you have a given attribute. And in the notation from probability from the previous slide, we can say having a certain attribute A is not related to the true outcome Y. And that means the probability for positive and negative true outcomes has to be equal. 
So if it doesn't matter whether or not you belong to a certain group, well then the probability of having an outcome, whether it's positive or negative, should be equal. And that is exactly what the equation states here, where the probability of y assuming 0 or 1, so having a negative or positive outcome, does not depend, is not conditional, on whether or not you belong or whether you have attribute A. So to measure the bias of a data set or estimator then, we can just subtract those two things from one another and get the difference, and that is going to be our disparity measure. So that's the probability of having a certain outcome if you don't belong to the group or if you don't have the attribute, minus the probability of having a certain outcome, either positive or negative, if you do belong to the group. We can now say that there is no disparity if the difference in probabilities is equal to zero. And just for notation here, we're going to say that A equals one is going to be our advantaged group. So the group that has more positive outcomes or better outcomes from the model predictions in general. And as you might notice here, it's going to be very hard to ensure that these two probability values are going to be exactly the same and meet the equation and come out as zero. So we're going to have to relax that equation a little bit. And this is what brings us to another metric here, and that's going to be the difference in demographic parity and a relaxation threshold epsilon. So now we have the absolute difference, and we're going to say that the absolute difference between those two probability measures should be less than or equal to a certain threshold. Another variation of the equation is the so-called disparate impact measure, and we have it here. It's the ratio of probabilities, and again, keep in mind here that in the denominator, A equals 1 is going to be our advantaged group. So here we're saying that the ratio of probabilities needs to be greater or equal to 1 minus an epsilon threshold. And in fact, this has also found its way into the Likro literature and as the so-called four-fifths rule as well. And we're going to revisit disparate impact again later in this class as well. What do we do in the case of regression? Well, now we don't have labels, but we do have score ranges, prediction scores R. And again, to say that they are statistically independent of the sensitive attribute, we can calculate, for example, the difference. We can also look at the difference in mean per group. And similar to what we talked about earlier, when we calculated the accuracy difference, we would want the difference in means to be zero. We're going to continue to follow the taxonomy introduced earlier, and the next criteria that we want to talk about now is going to be separation. Separation now states that the prediction y hat and the attribute a are independent conditional on the true outcome y. So what does that mean in terms of our predictions? Well, the true positive rate or false positive rate have to be equal for both attribute values a equals zero and a equals one. We have the equation here again, so probability of y hat, so the prediction now assuming one or zero, given that we have a certain attribute and we have a historical record that's either positive or negative, well, that needs to be equal for both sides of the equation, whether or not a is equal to one or zero. And the problem here is once again, that this is going to be very tough to meet. So we're going to have to apply a relaxation again. What is the relaxation that we want to use in this particular example? Well, we're going to use the relaxation of setting y equals to one. And that means we just want to equalize the true positive rate, and that's actually equality of opportunity. So we'll hear this again later when we talk about equality of opportunity or even equality of odds. So we're now restricting our y. The final criteria now is going to be sufficiency. And sufficiency is a target-based test, which requires that the true outcome the target that we want to predict is conditionally independent of the sensitive attribute given a prediction value. And here we're going to require numerical values. 
So for classifiers, we can use the predicted probabilities. We've seen an example of this earlier with the logistic regression. And this is usually only possible to test for model developers. So you really need to have access to the predicted values and not just the final class label or outcome. And an example here would be in lending. So again, our loan approval example. Applicants with similar predicted probabilities should have similar rates of acceptance across the different group memberships that we have. And we'll come back to sufficiency a little bit later and see this in practice as well. A few things to say about general limitations of all the fairness criteria that we had a look at just now. Number one, the optimization of one criteria, so maximizing one criteria, can actually lead to making another criteria worse. And another thing that we need to consider is that we need to usually define what level of grouping in terms of sensitive attributes and subpopulations we want to have. And there is actually an effect of accumulated bias. And this is what intersectional fairness is all about. So usually individuals, they have multiple different attributes and you can combine them, slice and dice them in different ways. And some potential combinations can actually lead to accumulated bias. So we really need to think about how granular do we want to make our subpopulations and our grouping. Another thing to keep in mind is that some of these metrics rely on using the sensitive attribute. In fact, all of them that I've just shown do actually rely on us having access to the sensitive attributes. And this is actually not something that we can take as a given. So there will be scenarios where there is no access to the sensitive attribute itself. And from a mathematical point of view, there's actually a so-called insufficiency of criteria where lazy solutions exist. So you could come up with random solutions that meet the criteria, but actually don't have high model performance. And this is again why it's very important to always measure the fairness as well as the overall model performance. To talk a little bit more about the incompatibility of the criteria we have on the left hand side, and this is again our loan application example. So on the left hand side here we have the separation criteria. And according to the separation criteria, everyone that can pay back for a loan would actually get approved. So that would be like saying they have the same true positive rate. So we have group A and group B here in shaded solid colors is the portion that actually can pay back. And then in the lighter shaded regions is the proportion of groups A and B that cannot pay back. According to the independence criteria, however, we would approve the same fraction in both groups. And assuming now that both group A and B are of same size, but one group has an intrinsically higher rate of payback, well then now we could actually argue that it's unfair towards group A because there's this proportion of people that could pay back and that should be eligible for the loan, but is not because we're implementing independence. So as you can see here, it's actually impossible to achieve both of these simultaneously. And we actually need to figure out which criteria we want to use and what makes sense 